Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I'm here to tell you about an awesome way for you to rub elbows with your favorite podcast host here on the Sports History Network. Well, at the same time, rooting for your hometown team this upcoming NFL season. You've been hearing all about our partner, Tailgate Fantasy, the past few weeks. Well, dig on this. Tailgate created a special Sports History Network League for our listeners, so we can put the word fan back into fantasy football together. It's free to join, and if you do so before the season kicks off, you'll automatically be entered into a drawing for a free t-shirt from one of our other partners, Home Field Apparel. It's a win-win-win! So hurry up today and head to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash tailgate for all the details. Again, at sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash tailgate. Blog Talk Radio. Tonight, we will go back in time to seasons past, when 22 men graced the record fields of yesterday, fighting for one more first down, one more yard gain, one final score, which would bring victory after 60 minutes of battle on the gridiron. Tonight, we'll explore the world of gridiron greats. Welcome to Gridiron Greats Football History of Memorabilia on the Gridiron Greats Publishing and Broadcasting Network, in conjunction with Swick Enterprises. We're live from the Wallingford, Connecticut home of Good Iron Greats Magazine. And I'm Bob Swick, publisher and editor of Good Iron Greats Magazine. And I'll be your host for the show. Good Iron Greats is the only publication in America which focuses upon the history and memorabilia of the North American football game since its inception in 1869. We cover 140 plus years of football history and memorabilia. And you can find us on the web at Good Iron Greats Magazine. We're sponsored in part by MSB Sports Cards. Check out their website for one of the largest selections of football cards and football memorabilia. MSBSportsCards.com And we're also sponsored in part by BSD Auctions. Check out their website for their upcoming auction this spring at BSDAuctions.com It is at this time. I'd like to introduce my co-host, he is a senior contributing writer to Gridiron Greats Magazine, <laughs> a football memorabilia historian, specializing in pre-World War II items, in particular Red Grange, and also Seattle Seahawk items, in particular Steve Larger. He hails yes. from Portland, Oregon. Mr. Joe Squires, Joe, welcome to the show this evening. Yes, Captain. Red Grange and Steve Larger in the same breath. Uh, that never That never gets old to me. Love it. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yep. Joe. Joe, All right. we're back. Football season has come to an end. But at the yep. same time, at Great Iron Greats Magazine, we never stop talking about football. Seven <laughs> days a week. Twelve months a year, 365 <laughs> days a year. Football is first and foremost in our minds. And we're going to start off... I think Brenda would agree with you. (laughs) We're going to start off the show this evening talking about the concepts of football dynasties. Exactly. Their relationship. Can they create a football card collecting dynasty? Joe? Exactly. Lead off with your thoughts and ideas. Well, Counselor, I would submit Exhibit A, the 1965 Topps Tallboy Joe Namath, arguably one of the, you know, one of the most recognizable cards in football. There's, you know, there's there's certain baseball cards that are recognizable. They transcend the boundaries. Mickey Mantle, Babe Ruth, and Joe Namath's cards is definitely up there. The Mount Rushmore of football cards, it's definitely up there. 
it's recognizable. Uh, real easy to say, why is Joe Namath in the Hall of Fame? There's one reason he's in the Hall of Fame, and that's because of calling the win and following through on that win. So there's one exhibit of, you know, a very expensive card. I mean, I think there's one in uh, – I think there's a, a Joe Namath rookie card PSA 9 uh, mm-hmm. that's uh, up for sale right now, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, it's definitely making that six-figure mark at $150,000 with like five, six days to go. So there's, there's that. Exhibit B would, would definitely be a, a Joe Montana, amazing quarterback, obviously part of a dynasty. I guess the, the big question here is there are dynasties in football, and we can rattle them off. The Packers, the Steelers, the Cowboys, the 49ers, the Seattle Seahawks. So the question is, is do, these, do these dynasties create dynasties in football cards? Uh you know, so does, you know, can a marginal player uh, who is part of a, a dynasty, uh, can his card become, you know, can, can his card become a dynasty as well? Or can that, can that set, for example? So, yeah, it's an interesting topic. It's one you and I have talked about before. There are, there are dynasties in, in the football card sets as well. I mean, 48 Leaf, 35 Chickle, these are just two sets that are amazing simply because they're chock full of Hall of Fame rookie cards. What do you think, Captain? And, you know, I, and I agree with what you're saying, and I, and I think it's something that I don't think a lot of football collectors really understand that as much as, say, in baseball you've got the Yankee dynasty, so all the Yankee cards have value, yada, yada, yada. It's the same way in football because, like you're saying, too, Joe Namath, 1965 Topps card, a card that uh-huh. I hold very dear to me because I still have the one I had a I bought in 1965. Uh, obviously, yep. it's in no way, you know, it's not a not a near mint card, and it's not a PSA graded card. It's so on my sheets, so on and so forth. However, you can really look, and and the and the one area I'm going to focus on 1970s Steelers cards. What was the dynasty team of of the 1970s? Basically, the Pittsburgh Steelers. The team behind them, uh, you know, played second fiddle all the time. The Vikings. The Vikings don't have the demand in the card dynasty as the Steelers would, especially Bradshaw's rookies, so on and so forth. So yeah, it is dark. true. There are there are football teams that are able to create that dynasty, and by creating that dynasty, they are they are able to really you know really boost up the values of the cards. Number one and number two, create a lot of interest and a lot of demand for those cards, and create collectors out of them at the same time. So I think that's very important to understand and and to look at. You know what I mean? And and so second, you know, to play into that, second fiddle, always playing the bridesmaid, doesn't create a demand. Take the Minnesota Vikings you talked about. Fran Tarkenton's uh, rookie card is nowhere near as valuable as Terry Bradshaw's in the same grade. Right. Uh, right, Take the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills of the 1990s, you know, went to four Super Bowls in a year or in a row. Right. Didn't they? And they lost all of them. Uh, and, you know, their cards are nowhere near, you know, what the Cowboys and the 49ers are of that year as well. Uh, right, right. So, I mean, it, and, and, and those dynasties create fan base. If you go to, you know, four Super Bowls in ten years and you win, you know, three or four of them, cow, you know, take the Cowboys and the Steelers, you create a fan base. And that fan base yep. wants to collect everything around their team. And oddly enough, missing from that, I mean, you've got, you've got the fandom, obviously, of the Green Bay Packers. Missing from that, oddly enough, would be Chicago Bears fans. I mean, you, you've got a right, rabid fan right. base, but nowhere near as rabid as, as other bases, I would say. Right, right. And I, and I you know? think, you know, I, I look at, I, I go back to looking at current current years as far as Super Bowls are concerned. We know the NFL is hung up on parity that we know the NFL is hung up on wanting to see different pe- different teams win every season. We, we, we yep. see this as a given, but you have the Patriots dynasty and I don't care what anybody says. They have been one of the most dominating teams in football 
over the past 15 years. I mean, there's no Absolutely. no second, you know, there's no argument against that. So is there a demand for Patriot cards? Yes, by all means. Tom Brady. Tom Brady cards. Patriot card. Um, pa- you know, his, card. His, you know, his rookie card of the 50 rookie cards he has. Certain rookie cards obviously are <laughs> through the roof right now as far as demand because they're supposedly, you know, less printed than the other ones, yada, yada, yada. But for a yeah. Tom Brady fan, and especially for a kid growing up that time frame, you know, he's going to want to collect the Brady card, and he's going to want to collect other cards of the Patriots and, and enjoy them also. And in doing so, again, here's a, here's a, here's a golden example of seeing a child, uh, you know, grow yeah. with the hobby because his, his, his team is winning, the Patriots are winning, the Brady, Brady cards are being collected, they're buying the packs, they're breaking them open, you know, so on and so forth. And, and I think that's, that's very, very healthy for the hobby. Now, obviously, if you're a fan of, let's say, the Tampa Bay Bucks, you're a fan of the Dolphins or whatever, You've had some long seasons here and there, with the exception of the Bucks winning, Dolphins haven't won in a long time, you know, so on and so forth. You can yeah. you can name any team, and it's a similar situation. I think what we're going to look at is each decade. There's a team of the decade, and I'm and I can't argue any other way. The Patriots are, are the team now, uh, with as many Super Bowls of these as, as they played in, as many games of, as they have won how they seem to come out of nowhere to win a game. You know, they're a dynasty team. Packers of the 60s, Steelers of the 70s, yep. 49ers of the 80s, Cowboys of the 90s, so on and so forth. You know, the Cleveland Browns Good of the point. 50s. You know, you argue, you, argue, you can argue all, all that. Yes, they do create the dynasty. Now the big question is for me, since I'm so focused on trying to get new collectors in the hobby, does that yeah. generate collecting interest? And in my opinion, it does. Well, and, and I say well, it with, with I, I say it just with uh, a grain of salt for the simple reason: kids today only have one choice of a brand yeah. being Panini. However, they have forty different types of brands within Panini that they can choose from: high end to low end cards. You know what I mean? You're spot so, on. Uh, You're spot on. I mean. Much easier to collect as a kid. If you wanted the Steve Largent rookie card, there was one rookie card, the 1977 right, right. Tops number 177. Now, if you right. want Brady's card, what is his card? I mean, there's you, you right. sarcastically said there's, you know, 100 to choose from. I, you know, there's probably more. Uh, yeah. And that's tough. It's got to be tough as a kid. Plus, they're expensive. You know, back yeah. then, we could well, you know, go plunk a quarter down yeah. and get it. But, I, I use I use the example if I go to a local show and I, and I'm talking about a local show you know, ten twelve tables set up you know probably six seven dealers type of thing, and I look at the little kids little kids I look at young you know teenagers say like kids from let's say age eight nine up to seventeen eighteen who are shopping they're either with their you know their parents or their aunt uncle or whatever or they're by themselves with a group of kids, and I'm trying to see what they're actually looking at. As far as football is concerned, they have no concern whatsoever yeah. for a set. They're just concerned about the player card. And is that necessarily good for the hobby? It could be argued either way. You know what I mean? And I, I can talk to them blue in the face. If you're going to create that kind of market, I just hope the market can sustain itself down the road. I could also hope yeah. that, you know, as they get older, and get into their 30s and 40s and have the greater disposable income, they're going to find some interest in cards from the 50s or the 60s or the 70s, you know what I mean, or in the, even in the 80s, and start collecting. Hopefully, yeah. Stuff. So I think that's, it's, it's that's what the I hope did. for the hobby. That's the hope yeah. for the hobby. And, yeah. and, again, and again, you're the exception to the rule because you're more of a historian, which is even more important that we see new historians come into the, into the marketplace and study, you know, the very old cards and study the history of the game, yeah. so on and so forth. You know, so yeah, no. um, it's funny when you when you talk to collectors nowadays. The majority of them have the same storyline. I got into collecting when I was a kid. Uh, collected from you know age eight up to age fourteen. Discovered girls. Stopped collecting football yep. cards. Went to college. 
came back uh, somewhere around 28 to 30. Something triggered it. Uh, suddenly, I was reintroduced to the hobby. I had discretionary income. And I started collecting again. Uh, right. You know, most, most people, me, present company included, follow that same storyline. So, obviously, dynasties in football create, uh, you know, create a following. Uh, if you're a Cleveland yeah. Brown fan and you're 40 yeah. years old, 40 years old, you probably don't collect a lot of football cards. I mean, sadly. Right. right. If you're, right. you know, if you're my age and you were born in San Francisco, you're probably, you know, you know, you probably followed football. When there's a parade running through, you, you know, your downtown once a year, hoisting the Lombardi Trophy, you know, that helps, you know, pique someone's interest. Uh, right. You know, right. so right. obviously right. dynasties in football help create fans, which help create, you know, dynasties in football cards. You know, Joe Montana, Jerry Rice, those those are incredibly valuable cards. Jerry Rice, obviously, is the greatest of all time. Second place is, isn't even in his rearview mirror. But, right. you know, you can, you know, Joe Namath, an average quarterback. I mean, I think he's one of the only quarterbacks in the Hall of Fame to have more interceptions and touchdowns, isn't he? Right, right. He is. He you is. Know. So, and he, so, and he, you know, again, it's, it's, because of his persona is is why he ended up the way he ended up. I mean, played in the media market at that time. He could do no wrong. I mean, yep. any article, like I remember growing up reading, you know, the Daily News and, uh, you know, a couple of the New York papers back then, the Herald Tribune, uh, you know, the papers are not around. But I'll tell you, football season, every other day, there was a big, long article on Joe Namath. Sports Illustrated, yep. Joe Namath every week, literally. <clears throat> You know, that kind of stuff. I mean, uh, and that, that was the beauty of the sport, I mean, growing up and, and just, you know, I, yeah. I was just mesmerized by the, these heroes, these stars. I mean, these guys were yeah. were giants, you know, as compared to today, no, no. where there, there's a lot more human, yep. humanistic uh, view of what's going on as yeah. compared to there was, you know, 50 years ago type of thing. But if somebody so, wanted to be private yeah. back then, they could be private. Now they, now, now they can't. But I mean, yeah, and exactly. isn't it interesting how one card, you know, can make a, a an entire set a dynasty? I mean, name right. another you know card that breaks five hundred dollars in the sixty five tops, you know, sixty five tops, you know, tall boy set. Right. And, you know, Winston, right. uh, Lance Allworth, obviously. You know, you've got a couple, but Joe Namath is that set. I mean, so is the sixty five yeah. tops set a dynasty in football cards simply because of one card? Joe Namath. Right, right. And the uniqueness it's, of that set. It's interesting to think about. The uniqueness of that set being the tall boy, the tall, taller curry, which I always found fascinating. I mean, I just fell in love with it. I, you know, I could still visualize when I was a kid buying the packs and open them. And I just thought it was the greatest <laughs> thing on, on earth. And then 66, they went back to the normal size. And I'm saying, well, gee, what happened to the 65 cards? And then, you know, years later, I find out what happened. And, boy, I, I really wish, uh, you know, they had stuck with it. And I and then I fast forward to 1992, and I'll never forget this one real quick um, point, and then we'll move on to our guest here. 1992 game day came out, and they had the, they were a tall boy set. And I, I just loved that set. I mean, I must have bought three, four boxes. I bought the official album, and I was just collating right. away, you know. And um, here's a set that's worth 20 bucks if you got the album and the binder. Is it a dynasty set? Not at all. You know, it's, it was in the mass-produced era, but I just I just took yeah. a liking to that for the three years that it was out. I just thought it was the coolest thing. And, um, you know, it came and it went type of thing. All right, good. That, that, yeah. Real good point. Dynasty teams creating dynasty cards. All right, I'd like to move creating on Creating right dynasty now. sets, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to move on to our guest. I'd like to welcome to our show tonight our special guest. He's the author of Gridiron on the Great Lake, the 1918 Fort Ontario Army football team. He's been a freelance writer for over 30 years and has won the 2015 Bob Carroll Professional Football Researchers Association Memorial Writing Award for the best article of that year which was the Oswego Shakespeare's and Disputed 1915 title, an article I do remember reading, uh, being a member of the PFRA. 
He works in security in the nuclear energy industry and lives near Lake Ontario, New York. I'd like to welcome to the show this evening, Mr. Doug Bigelow. Doug, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. It's a um, pleasure for me to be on your show. Well, Doug, awesome. Let's start off. Let's start off by asking you, how did you become interested in in the early game of football? Well, I'd say, uh, you know, I've always been interested in the, uh, you know, the early 20th century, and, and I really can't tell you why. Uh, it's obviously a, a difficult time in life, but, you know, much much more difficult uh, living standards than uh, I would want to put up with. But probably one of the main reasons is, you know, the, the old game of football, the old rough and tough, you played with bruises, you played with cuts. Uh, it was kind of like uh-huh. when, you know, when we were a kid and we played ball in the neighbor's yard, you know, you get – beat up, you get banged up, you got a fat lip, you didn't have any pads on. At the end of the night, you went home. If you weren't, you know, if you weren't dragging your leg and you didn't have anything broken, you know, it was a good day. And that's kind of the way <laughs> football was in the early 20th century. I remember many days like that uh, playing when I was a kid and my mother yelling at me because I got my pants dirty or I got a tear or whatever. And uh, quick story on this, I remember coming home. I had such a bruise on my knee. My mother went through the roof when she saw it. She thought I was never going to walk again. And, and basically, it just, you know, <laughs> scabbed over, and I played the next day, and that was uh, no big deal. So that, 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 that's, a, that's a good observation. Today, obviously, kids today, if they play on um, on a field, they need insurance cards and whatever else. Waivers. 60 parents, wa- 60 parents watching them on, for a pickup game type of thing. So uh, it's a good observation on your part. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't seen a I haven't seen a pickup game in someone's yard in twenty years. Jeez. Well, you gotta you gotta come over yeah. to our house and we have a family gathering. I, I I bring the football out and the, I have the girls and the guys all get together, the nieces and nephews, and uh, they they fight it out. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> well, that's uh, for sure. Bob, that Bob's good getting one. a little advanced. Bob's getting up there in age, so obviously he's full time quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> on both yeah, sides, yeah. The there's line. nothing wrong with that. Yeah, on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to to his question, Doug, how'd you how'd yeah. you go? Oh, just I guess that was it. You know, you just watching pickup games and stuff. Interesting. All right. Well, you know that's you know just that time frame. I I don't know what it is about it. I've always loved it. The 1920s, you know, up into the 30s. Maybe it's the gangsters or or you know, and that's uh, you know the yeah. 1918. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I got I got caught up in story, storytelling. I thought uh, I, I thought we were still <laughs> sorry about that. And by the way, uh, I, I thought it was kind of funny for our listeners. Doug, Doug called into the show yesterday, and uh, you know was, was emailing us. You know, hey, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know, did I miss something? So he called in 24 hours early, which I thought was funny. I just wanted to mention, Doug. I like to call in. You know. I like to call in days in advance too, and just kind of wait on hold for Bob. Bob prefers it that way too. So. Well, you know, my wife hates it that I'm early for everything. I always want to get out the door, you know, half an hour early or whatever. And she hates the fact that we get the appointments early and stuff like that. But maybe this one was pushing the limit just a little too far. You're on personal Vince record Lombardi 24 time. hours early. Yeah. yeah, you're on Vince Lombardi time. Like you have to be an hour an hour uh, ahead of time with him on everything. But that's okay. <laughs> Okay. No, no good. So, hey Doug, how'd you come up with the idea for your current book, Gridiron on the Great Lake? I mean, I you know I read your website, but you know, but I didn't really see any history there. You know, of, of just you know that particular book. Right. Well, uh, actually, I was researching an article uh, for the Pro Football Research Association. You know, they wanted me to talk about the Shakespeare's and their disputed 1915 title. And uh, actually, I probably 30 years ago. This shows how old I am. I was in the uh, Swiggle City Library in Swiggle, New York, and I was going through some microfiche on the old microfiche viewer. If anybody's ever done that, you know how much fun that is. <laughs> and, I, and I came across, you know, a picture of this of Swiggle Shakespeare's team. And I was, working, you know, looking into something else. I couldn't even tell you what it was. I don't remember. But, uh, I, you know, I got the old steno pad out, and I jotted down some notes, wrote down about the team, whatnot, and then just kind of moved on and literally – 25 years later, I come across that steno pad. I pull it out. I start looking at, you know, now we've got Google and the oh, Internet wow. and all that. So I start digging into the Shakespeare's a little bit. I find out who they are. And actually, I was um, 
trying to find out information from the fort because Fort Ontario is a historical site right now. You know, it's an active site. And uh, I contacted oh, wow. the superintendent there. His, his name is Paul Lear. And because I was trying to find out information about the, you know, 1915-14 that played Oswego because you know, they kind of had a local rivalry. And when we were uh, kind of brainstorming about different things, he said to me, uh, you know, we had an unbeaten team here in 1918, which I didn't know anything about. So, of course, I go home, start looking up that one, and it was an extremely good team. I mean, it had, you know, quite a cast of characters. It was unbeaten. Uh, nobody even scored on them, how good they were. You know, locally they dominated. And that's really what got me on the hunt for the fourth team of 1918 was just that one snippet of information from him. It's kind of funny what, you, uh, uh, in, your, in our emails, but in our, in our emails back and forth, you referred to one person on the team as a poor man's Jim Thorpe, which I really, which yeah. really cracked me up. Yeah, that was uh, his name was Arthur Buffalohead. He was a Native American from the Ponca tribe in Oklahoma, and during um, uh, World War II, they they turned Fort Ontario, or I'm sorry, World War One. They turned Fort Ontario into a hospital, what they call the General Hospital, and they they added on a lot of buildings and whatnot. Quite a few soldiers that came from uh, Oklahoma and Kansas and, and stuff like that, and they were you know the ambulance corps. They they trained at Fort Ontario before they went over to become mobile hospital units in in France. And Buffalo Head was one of the Native Americans from there. He came over. He transferred to the, you know, the unit that stayed at the hospital, and he played on the team, and he was literally one of the top two players. He he played. He That's came good. from, um, yeah, the uh, Haskell Indian Institute in, in Kansas, wow. which is kind of like the Carlisle Indian School was in Pennsylvania. You know, and hmm. he, uh, he, he had, a, I think, the track record for the Hundred Yard Dash, which was comparable to Thorpe. He played basketball. He led it on the basketball team. He did play on the football wow. team, but not not at the level of, you know, he wasn't like a star. But when he came to the fort, he and another goal, well, there was three or four guys that were, you know, the, the uh, ultimate stars on the team. But he's probably the uh, the coolest one. You know, he's got the coolest name and, and just the travel. Yeah. Get there. You know what right. I what I, I, I take that about, as a compliment. What I found. Oh, for sure. I think, it was a fl- I think it was a flat 10 seconds he ran the 100 yard dash in. And, that, and that's exactly, I think, what Thorpe ran in it. What I found interesting when Joe brought that up in the email, I said to myself, how many of those guys probably all played 3-4 sports back then? Because it was very common. Mm. They played baseball. They played basketball. They would play Thorpe. track and field. They played football. And, you know, Thorpe. how many guys were, were like a Thorpe? You know, there, there probably were obviously many guys who, who excelled maybe in one or two of those sports. And they didn't do that well in the other ones, but they played anyways because you know it was part of the part of the team atmosphere, part of the army atmosphere, whatever it may have been. And uh, you, you know, we can, we don't really realize how many great athletes were from that era because we look at that era, I think, a lot differently than we do you know the current era where everything is so specialized. And even kids in school today, in high school, they're only playing one sport. I mean, when I you know when I was in high school back in the seventies, I. I most of the teams were all three teams. They were the baseball team, they were the uh, basketball team, they were the football team. And then we also had, you know, the soccer guys that played hockey, that did track and field, so on and so forth. But most most athletes over the years played more than one sport. So I think that was that yep. was a very interesting point you brought up about, you know, being a poor man Thorpe. And really, he was he was a very good athlete, you know? Yeah. Yeah, on, on the Fort team, he actually played on their baseball and their basketball teams too during during the different seasons. He was, I think he was six foot three, so he was a top you know basketball player in uh, and then the baseball team. I can't remember what position he played, but uh, you know he was he was a star all the way around. And that that's to be a, a nice part of, of that of that history of the game, you know, in the twenties, you know, actually before nineteen hundred, basically nineteen hundred through the the nineteen forties where so many guys, and even up into the 50s, so many guys, even professional players in the 50s, were still playing multiple sports. You know, Dave DeBusher, good example. Um, you know, a lot of football players were playing playing other sports, uh, you know, trying to get, hook on to baseball to make some extra money, so on and so forth. So uh, right. that's a good, that's an interesting point and something 
uh, obviously football historians understand it, but I think a lot of people, you know, with just the general passing knowledge don't realize how, how gifted these guys were. And as an athlete, yep. that they had the ability to play all these different sports. So uh, it's, it's something interesting to note and something that, you know, again, I don't think a lot of people really realize that. Right. Doug, I got to ask you a question. Well, we're talking about your research on on this team and the history of the team. Uh, tell us a little bit about besides you coming apart, you know, coming upon that Seno pad again. And if I could, I'd like for you. This is a little off script, but can you point out a little of the information and the background as far as the uh, sickness and epidemics that occurred at that time? In case people don't really understand what happened, you know, at the time of World War One and, and a massive influenza uh, uh, epidemic yeah. that occurred throughout the world, uh, which impacted our country, which in, in, impacted the war, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's one of the big things that surprised me that I came across as I was doing it was they they literally had a shortened season because of the influenza. I think it. it it came in three different stages. The first stage was, I believe, in March of um, of the year. It wasn't quite as bad. But when it, the second stage that hit, you know, worldwide was, well, at least in Port Ontario or in the United States, it, it mainly hit from um, the last week of September 1918 to the first week of November 1918, literally right in the beginning of the football season. And that's when wow. probably... 80% of the deaths occurred, you know, in the country. Uh, it, it came, it, it went away and came back again in the spring of the 1919, but not nearly as bad. But uh, worldwide, I believe they say between 50 and 100 million people died from it. And, and in the United States, it figured between 650 and 750,000 died from it. And a lot of them were soldiers because, you know, they're compressed together all the time and the viruses are flying around. And um, that was uh, one of the biggest things during the football season, the fort being a hospital, and everywhere in the country was in the same situation. You know, doctors are dying, nurses are dying, you don't have as much staff. And at the fort they had they had to take the uh, the extra, you know, ill people from the city because the city was, you know, bogged down, their their hospital was over overloaded. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, the fort dealt with it, too. And, in fact, you know, I, one of the chapters is on the American Red Cross and what they did. And another chapter in the book is on the influenza epidemic itself at the fort worldwide. And I even did a small bio on uh, one of the nurses that uh, right, right. worked at the fort. And, in fact, she even, you know, she died from influenza while at the fort. So, uh, you know, it, wow. it was that that's one of the things I mean I always thought it was a history buff but until I started digging into that I didn't realize how bad that was I mean literally mm-hmm. you know, like they said in the city of Philadelphia they would bring out their family members who had died overnight and leave them on the sidewalk for the city to come pick them up because there was yep. so many they yep. couldn't bury them you know they couldn't find even couldn't even find people to bury them they make families bury their own family members because you know they just didn't have the, the staffing numbers yeah, yeah. I heard yeah, it was about one. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Bob. No, um, what I was going to point out, you know, people say we had a flu epidemic this winter uh, here in Connecticut. Right? Whatever it was, like 50, 60 people died from the flu. I look back to you know an epidemic like influenza, where you got hundreds of thousands of people dying. You know, the flu right. epidemic today of 2018 is vastly different than an epidemic of 1918, and that's how far our medicine right. has gone to to improve things, right. uh, you know, and again, yeah. to me, a little common sense in 2018 goes a long way as compared to 1918 when you really, you know, you really didn't have the information on how to protect yourself, so on and so forth. So that, that was a, to me, that was an excellent and very interesting part of the book because it really tied into, you know, the, the conditions that these guys played their season in on top right. of everything, you know, risking right. death yep. just to play the game. Joe, go ahead. Yeah, a lot of a lot of colleges and the service teams, you know, they they didn't have any games that, for that six week period just for that reason. High school teams, right. you know, they they were, you know, they were barring people from even uh, having get-togethers in the cities because you know they just they knew it was getting spread around by yep. people. And, right. But there wasn't yep. much they could do for it except make them comfortable. They didn't have any any uh, uh, any medicine to 
you know, counter the yeah. illness. Or it's, it's kind of it's kind of funny where where my grandmother is buried. Uh, a lot of the graves around here I noticed, you know, had you know had you know death dates of you know seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Some of them were very young, and uh, right. like, like ten years ago, ten years ago, trying to figure out what happened to right around then, looking it up, I'm going, wow. And if I remember correctly, it was like five percent, one in twenty people were you know were killed by this, you know, disease. Mm-hmm. So you know, we're we're a little off topic. Let's swing around to something a little more uh, uplifting, shall we say? Uh, <laughs> Doug, word is out. Word is out on the street. You uh, you collect the fifty-five tops All-American set and the sixty-one new card. Uh, just to just you know to you know to know the company you're in. The uh, I'm, I've been working for a couple of years, much to Bob's chagrin, on a uh, article on what the most popular sets are. And fifty-five tops All-American. I'll I'll, I'll cut to the back page. Uh, the 55 Tops All-American is the number one most collected set uh, out of any football set. So you're in good company in picking that set, my friend. Well, that's uh, why I can't afford it. Out- <laughs> 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 They're actually pretty affordable. There's, you know, I'd say out of the 100 cards, there's about 10 of them that are, you know, spendy. Your, you know, your Don Hudson's, your Fats Henry, you know, it's, your Jim Thorpe's in there, Red Grange. I mean, those in high grade are pretty expensive, but... How would you, uh, yeah. you get into the How would you get into collecting that set, especially the '61 new card? I don't I don't think I've ever met anyone who collects that set. Well, the uh, you know I, I'm like everybody else in the '70s and '80s when I was a kid. I collected the you know football cards, and I primarily because of my location, I primarily went for the uh, you know ex Syracuse football players. I didn't collect sets, you know, I collected mm. people, and uh, I did that for quite mm. a while. And then you know the '90s rolled around, just like everybody else, it got flooded and. You'd, you know, you'd have the third string kicker from Syracuse who's got 10 cards out there in one year because, you know, all the different sets and whatnot. So I kind of ventured off it. But I kept a few of my cherry ones. And two of them that I had was the two from the 61 new card set was Ernie Davis and Dave Serrett. And yeah. They were, you know, the national oh. champions. And everybody knows Ernie Davis' story. And, um, oh. and another one from the 55 set was Joe Alexander, a, a college Hall of Famer from Syracuse. So I always kept them. Huh. And, and probably about 10 years ago, you guys will probably know this without, you know, right off the top of your head. All of a sudden on eBay, there came all these unopened wax packs from 1961. And I don't know where yeah. they came from, but there were a lot of them out there. And so I started, yeah. you know, I bought a few. And, of course, I couldn't help myself. I had to open them. And then, then I saw how cherry they were. And I bought a few more, and I kept buying, kept buying. I ended up, I think, with two full sets from the 61 set. And maybe two half wow. sets, plus uh, you know some others mixed in. And and I, and you, if you look now, you can still see some really really nice sixty one cards out. Oh there. yeah. And that's a reasonable oh, set, yeah. Yeah. you know, price wise to collect. But uh, and I, I wonder. Very common. Yeah, I've always wondered. I think I still have three of the packs that I kept from on myself. I'm opening. I don't know yeah, where don't they came from. Those. Somebody had them in a warehouse in a vault somewhere. Don't open those. Well, did you find? Did you did you hear about the uh, unopened cache of uh, 55 Tops All American that was found about ten, probably about eight nine years ago? There was a a salesman who worked for Tops who stuffed about eight or nine boxes of uh, 55 Tops All American wax packs in his closet, found, and uh, some of them are open. So you you used to see, you know, PSA nine was was about as high as it got for 55 AA. And then all of a sudden, about eight, nine years ago, there's one guy down in California who came out with this nearly all PSA 10 set. And it was, you know, from his, you know, his uncle finding these wax packs, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah, he flooded the all, he flooded the AA, you know, set. What, to back up a bit on the 61 new card set, what's interesting about that set, I don't know if you saved them, were the pennant inserts, um, the subset, is a tough subset to, to complete. And those pennant inserts are, you know, there are several collectors out there who are trying to put that set together. So I don't know if you ever did anything with that, but uh, that'd be interesting. That's an interesting subset. It just shows the pennant of the college. Um, and again, how they lasted over the years is anybody's guess. You know what I mean? I'm sure a lot of them stuck together in the like uh, in that set, but um, okay. 55 all American. Well, yeah, just those two cards. Okay. You, you collect the whole set, don't you? You did, you just mentioned those two cards, but you collect the whole set, don't you? 
Oh, yeah, the, the whole set of new cards? Yeah. No, or, no uh, uh, 55 tops. No, the 50, the 55 All-American. Yeah, 55 All-American. You know, I started off with just the Joe Alexander, but, I, you know, I've added on to it now. I've got the... Uh, I've got Rocky, I've got the Four Horsemen, I've got Thorpe, and then you know, I've got about a dozen other ones. I've, I've just kind of started collecting, you know, in, oh, into that. Okay. Uh, but, you know, I mean, yeah. what is it, 100 and, 102 or 100 card set with two errors? So that, that, that's quite cards, a ways yeah. down the road before I totally finished that one. But I'm looking that's at this pretty every it, day it on pretty, eBay. Oddly enough, I mean, you know, your PSA 8 uh, commons, for 55 AA, it will cost you about 100 bucks. I mean, you, you can put that set together relatively inexpensive. Obviously, you'll bump up against right. the Thorpe, the Grange, the Hudson. You know, there's quite a few quote unquote, you know, Hall of Fame rookie cards in there. You know, the Hudson right. being, you know, the Don Hudson right. being one of them. Yep. Yeah. Boy, Don Hudson, 1935 Chickle Don Hudson. I did an article for Gridiron Greats like five years ago, Bob. And I I uh, had a friend of mine make what what the uh, what the thirty five chickle Don Hudson card would look like. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you remember that? Oh. So, yeah, yeah, uh, I've, yeah I've, nice. got a, I've got a mock up of that. That was nice. So, Doug, have uh, do you have any any uh, stories you want to share with our audience tonight about writing this book and or creating your website, which is grid on the great gridiron on the Great Lake? Well, um, I, I suppose, you know, as far as writing it, it's, you know, it's the type of thing where a lot of people have asked me afterwards, you know, how you go about doing it. The main thing is just writing. You're, you're breaking up there, Doug. Yeah, Can Doug, you hear me now at all? Yeah. That's you, you broke up there a little bit. All right, sorry. So oh, uh, as far as writing it, yeah, you're better you know, I, okay. I, I, you got me now? Yeah. yeah, perfect. Okay, so I, I found a couple of weird things that you know while I was writing it. Uh, one was uh, you know the team was always said to have been six and zero, had an unbeaten record, which which is true. But while I was researching, I found that they really only played five games. They never played a sixth game, um, and you know that's the kind of thing I love finding when I'm digging you know digging through the old archives and stuff like that. But uh, I don't know the 1919 Spalding Football Guide listed them as playing six games, and I. I've never been able to find out where they came up with that six game because I discovered that, you know, you know, from the newspaper articles that the game was snowed out. So where they came up with it, where they came up with the score, but, you know, it's news to me. But um, um, another thing that really stood out was difficult that time frame was, not only like the influenza that we talked about, but the war itself. You know, I, I read a yeah. lot of letters from uh, soldiers' home and, and nurses' home. You know, I was always looking for, you know, football connections because they played football over in Europe at the end of the war. They actually had a championship and everything. And I've got, you know, a chapter on that in the book. And that's what I was looking for. But I kept coming across these stories about, uh, you know, the, the death and destruction and, uh, you know, the machine guns and, you know, the, all these new weapons that were introduced that just mm-hmm. the devastation was, you know, horrific. And almost every mm-hmm. letter that I read told about the smell, you know, the, the smell of death oh, everywhere. Geez. So yeah, that was you know that's kind of difficult, but uh, and I was actually I was lucky enough to interview a, a gentleman here in the city of Oswego whose whose father was in the war, and uh, oh wow, uh, he, I did a chapter called uh, Oswego Zone, which was from the uh, a company that was made up from men from Oswego, and this guy's father was one of them. So I, I you know I sat down and talked to him. He showed me some letters, told me about his his father, and uh, those are tough times. I don't know. You know, the PTSD they had imagine. back then. That you know they what they call it yeah. shell shock. I think back in those days. And then they came home yeah. and just kept their mouth shut and went on with life. Yeah. The other thing I want to, the other thing, Doug, I'd like to ask you if if you know, again, this is off script. Were there any actual game day programs of any of those games, even if it was like a like a mimeograph sheet? Do you know of anything uh, of any sort of what they did with that, or there, there's nothing there other than the newspaper reports? All I've ever seen was a newspaper, of course, but I'm pretty sure that there were some game day programs. Uh, I, I've come across similar things when I, when I was hunting online trying to find, you know, uh, research material. 
Because I know that uh, mm-hmm. two of the service teams played in the 1919 Rose Bowl. It was the Great Lakes Naval Reserve, and they played against the right. Bear Island Marines. So in California, so that they have to have had a program for that game. I just, how could they not have had a yeah. Rose Bowl program? Yeah, we actually interviewed the fellow who wrote the book on that a few weeks back. So that's pretty interesting. And I know there, yeah, the Rose Bowl, the bigger games, there was actual uh, programs. But I'm just curious because a lot of the real early service teams, not so much World War Two, but World War One, and in the 20s, um, the, the they're very very limited as far as any type of memorabilia, any type of program or ticket stuff from from that time. I'm just curious if you actually you know, actually came across something, you know, you know, an actual program or the actual ticket stub, whatever the case might be. But uh, I would always find that to be very interesting and very historical, to say the least. Yeah, I, 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 Any, I have it myself. I know uh, there is a photo of the 1918 football team from the fort, and I saw a okay. copy of it, but unfortunately it was like a copy of a copy of a copy, you know, Xerox, and it was so horrible you could hardly even tell that there was people in it. And I mean, I dug right, and dug wow. and dug to try and find a better copy because you know that that'd be a treasure in itself, and it just doesn't right. seem to be out there. Right. It's interesting if wow. I go into an antique if I go into an antique shop, I always look at the old photos because I I can I, I you never know what you might find there. You might find just like a, a portrait of somebody in a, in a very dark sweater, and you could recognize right away that might be a football sweater type of thing. You know. And uh, right. then you could try to batch it, you know, take, you know, pull out all the all the books of that era or whatever, and see if we can match match that person with somebody being a college player or army player, or whatever the case might be. So that's pretty yeah. interesting at the same time. Yeah, I know there are photos floating around, like team photos uh, from the 1918 and 1919 seasons. But you know, I've seen like the Spalding guide from 1919 has a whole bunch of them inside the book itself. Obviously, you know, right. they're not the original. Right. And I, any, I wonder any, if there's any originals even out there. Right. Any collector realizes you. that the uh, Spalding guides, in my opinion, are are great, a great collectible and very, very historical, to say the least. Uh, and if you could find them, and they're out there, you can find them. I mean, the history in those books are just incredible, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you know, I use the 1918 and 1919 guides to to give me a lot yeah, of my information. Yeah. They, they are pretty pretty nice. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Doug. You brought up earlier just the toughness of the people. and You know, you can smell the death. I mean, just definitely a different, you know, era, you know, to grow up in. Uh, you know, now we have quiet rooms, uh, you know, <laughs> at, at, at our workplace. Uh, my, my nine-year-old son the other day asked me, uh, you know, who's – who's the best quarterback, you know, in the NFL? And I was like, well, that's very subjective because different quarterbacks played at different times. And I'm like, you know, there's a big question mark. Would a, you know, would a Tom Brady of today be able to survive, you know, even back when Joe Montana was playing where, you know, where a linebacker like Lawrence Taylor got, you know, an extra step once the ball left your hand, uh, you know, even take, you know, Bart Starr or Johnny United, those guys getting the crap kicked out of them or all the way back to Otto Graham or, I mean, just, and it was, it was interesting because, you know, he's like, well, you know, I thought you knew everything about football. I'm like, no, you're mistaking me for Bob Swick. Uh, you know, <laughs> he's like, so yeah, there the, the really is no definitive answer of, you know, who the best quarterback is. Cause you know, who could, you know, yeah, it, yeah it's interesting, but yeah makes me think about the toughness of NFL players now. But, I mean, you know, take, you know, Chuck Bednarik. I mean, the guy did concrete. He was a concrete salesman in the summer, you know, when, when yep. football wasn't playing. I mean, and, and now, you know, you take, you know, Cam Chancellor, for example, a, you know, a safety for the Seahawks. He's, pr- he's probably out. He pro- could probably bench press, you know, Chuck Bednarik. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you know yeah. with some of these rules and, and safety measures comes – you know, comes a, 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 a more well-defined athlete. I don't know. Just rambling, I guess, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I know exactly what you mean. It's, it's a whole different a whole different game back in those days, and, and that's probably one of the reasons why I like researching and writing about them because, you know, there's, there's that respect for them. Uh, you know, you watch the games today, and, yeah, the flag is flying. I mean, 
uh, you know, Brett Brett Farr, you know, put on his golden jacket yep. yesterday and a couple of days ago, and somebody asked him, you know, if uh, what he thought about football nowadays and if he would let his kids or grandkids play. And his answer was, you know, he's like, I, I'm, I'm pretty healthy right now. I've got my aches and pains. But he's like, I don't know if I'm going to wake up tomorrow and not be able to remember my name. And he goes, I yeah, definitely right. would advise, advise my grandkids against playing football. So you've got, yeah. you know, you've, you've got the people who made their living off of the game, you know, denying, you know, the very game that allowed them the pulpit. It's, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think any, any, any living comes with a certain amount of consequences, you know, whether it's flagging or, you know, whether you're a flagger, whether you're a construction worker, whether you're a, you know, an accountant or a CPA, there's, there's mental anguish, there's physical anguish. It's, I, I don't know. It's, you know, No, totally yeah, on board. Hearing, totally. hearing hearing Green Bay's uh, you know Green Bay's you know Crown Prince deny football was kind of interesting, Bob. Yeah, I think you find a lot of those. A lot of the pros have been, yeah. been saying yeah. that some of the older guys, you know, I mean, you see guys like Steve Smith laying in a hospital bed, you know, can't speak, can't move. That's just the kind of things that I can understand them telling their kids like go go play Parcheesi or something. It's not uh, wow, Steve Smith. The Carolina Panther wide yeah. receiver? I didn't know that. No, 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 no. The, oh, yeah. Well, the, yeah, I'm a Raiders fan. That's the old no, Raiders no, no. fullback. The Steelers guy, I thought. Oh, yeah, the, the old Raiders, yeah, okay. the old Raiders fullback, Steve Smith. He's yeah, 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 back. Yeah. Uh, oh, got it. Yeah, yeah. I think in the '90s, yeah, yeah. He's in, he's in pretty well. I'm not even sure if he's still alive, to be honest with you. But hey, Doug, where yeah. where can your book be bought? I I should have brought that up earlier. Well, you can go to Amazon.com, and you can buy it, you know, from my website or Amazon. Uh, you know, I have a list of both. You, you blanked out there a little bit, Doug. I don't know if you stepped away from the yeah. phone or if it's in a bad spot, but you blanked nope. out there a little bit. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah, it's. Uh, you can go to the website, which is gridirononthegreatlake.com, and on there I have, you know, the orders section you can either order it from me or you can order it from amazon there's a link to amazon or you can right. go right to amazon and order okay that's good and bob you're doing a you're doing a write-up of the of the book and yeah in, I, in, I, finished, in right? I finished the book i'm going to do a review on the next issue and uh it should be pretty um i i enjoyed the book i enjoyed the book for two reasons it blended football with the history of the day back then and I, I've always enjoyed that. And, again, for the early game, any information you have that you're preserving the history of the early game, I think is critical to football history. And, again, it ties into football memorabilia at the same time. So I think that, the, you know, I, I think, to me, any of those types of books, I, I truly treasure them. And I know, Doug, you, you did an excellent job within the book uh, of explaining, you know, really – Mm-hmm. the historical background of what was going on besides the football background at the same time. And I did enjoy, and I'll, I'll point out uh, real quick, you did uh, post starting lineups for some of the games there as far as uh, at toward the end of the book. I'm trying to find it right now. But uh, you had a preseason section and, and you had the, the regular season section. So I thought that from a historical point of view was excellent also. So uh, I did appreciate reading it, and um, I'm, I'm glad we had the opportunity to, to talk tonight. Are you working on anything in the future, or, or this is it for now? No, actually, I, when I was when my editor had the book, you know, you, you, I, I couldn't stay uh, idle, so I started researching the old 1932 Colgate uh, University football team. And quickly, oh, okay. right right. uh, they was unbeaten, untied, unscored upon, and uninvited. Uh, they were. They were kind of shafted, didn't get invited to the 33 Rose Bowl, so I'm I'm kind of going right, at that angle. Right, they were right. an extremely good team, but uh, so I'm I'm just starting to work on that one. Okay, these uh, are well, labors of, for definitely la- Yeah, and these are definitely labors of love, Doug. So I mean, we, we tip the hat to people who hunker down and write these things, who you know focus on a you know on a brief moment in time, and you know of things that deserve to be written about. Like tip of the hat, man. Thank you for doing this. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I appreciate the interview, and I appreciate doing the uh, book review, too. That, that always helps a lot. Oh. All right. And, again, for our listeners out there, gridironthegreatlake.com, check it out. Buy that book. We'll be in, I'll have my review in, in the 
uh, upcoming spring issue of Gridiron Greats Magazine, which is going to be uh, out in April. Doug, thank you for being on the show tonight, and stay in touch. We'll be in touch, and uh, I got to look. Check out your email because I got to tell you real quick. I, I heard from Tex Noel's wife, and I just want to publicly say Tex is still in rehab. Uh, he's finally getting some movement in one of his arms and getting some movement in his knee. It's a real long process, but she said he's doing better, and I was happy to finally hear from her uh, with what's going on. But he's still in rehab. I'm going to send you some info via email. And if any of our listeners want to know any more, just send me an email, and I'll, uh, I'll I'll tell you what she said in, in more detail. But he said to say hi, and um, he's trying to do better, and we're all hoping Tex can pull back and uh, be back on track. Oh, definitely, definitely. Thank you, also gentlemen. Great the great Lake. I'm sorry. Thank you, Doug. Uh, oh, thank thanks, you. Doug. All right, we're, we're down only a few minutes. Uh, real quick, just as a reminder, we're sponsored by MSB Sports Cards. Check out their website, msbsportscards.com. BSD Auctions. Check out their website and their upcoming auction, bsdauctions.com. Two-minute warning and wrap-up. Joe, I'm handing off to you. What would you pick up on tonight's show? I'm just going to say I really wish the fellows at BST, Spano and Becker, if you're listening, send, send Bob and I a, a link to the preview of the upcoming auction. You know, we're not going to bid on anything. We just want to, we just want to peek under the hood and see what you got. I mean, you know, more, more Mike Blaisdell stuff. Come on, man, help a brother out. Jeez. He's a, a sponsor on the show. You, <laughs> you'd think that they would help, help us out, man. I mean, yeah. Maybe they're helping you out, and you're not telling me, Bob. <laughs> yep. Who knows? It, well, is, it is what, what it I is. Learn? But, again, I, I, give, I give credit to anybody yeah. who, who goes into this kind of detail, spends that kind of time, you know, like the yeah. Chris Willis's, the, the Duck Buck goes out yeah. there who, who write this stuff, preserving the, the history of the game, you know, yep. coming upon, you never know, you could come upon some memorabilia from that time. I just think it's the greatest thing in this in the world. And again, you and I have the front row seat to seeing this, to listening yes. to it, to watching it, to reading it, and uh, I just think it's it's truly incredible. And I and I, again, here's another book that I I did it in one night. I'm you know I started it you know a little too late, and I'm up too late, but I, I have to finish it because I found it fascinating. And uh, again, to our, our uh, listeners. Look out for my book review, and as far as I'm concerned, it's it's, it's well worth the uh, the price to buy it and to read about football history. I want to back up one real real quick when we're talking about dynasties. One more thing came came into my mind. Uh, as you know, the national this year is in Cleveland, and what I normally do is I try to focus um, bringing stuff from that area. People know me in Chicago. I, I'll bring Bears stuff. Packers stuff, so on and so forth. Obviously, in in Cleveland, I bring Browns, I bring Bengals, I bring Steelers and Eagles stuff. It'll be interesting to see, like you said, how much of the newer stuff of the Browns, if anything, anybody's going to want. You know what I mean? And, again, a team that has done that bad for so many years now, uh, I mean, what's the the point of the whole thing? How How can you really even be a current Cleveland Brown fan? I'll say nothing from, you know, the 70s and back or even the '80s in the back, but this new this new team is just to me just so completely mismanaged. It's just so irrational to watch. It's not even funny. And I, and I briefly remember, I think it was a couple seasons ago, I caught a Giants Browns game out in Cleveland, and it, it had to have been the most difficult game I've watched in years because it was so <laughs> badly played. I mean, seriously, I, I, I was embarrassed for both teams. I really was. It was just it was just pathetic. But that's me and. Again, being a purist, I expect the uh, you know sixty minutes of tough football, and we have good, com- good get, competitive you got football. It, yeah. You got it in a nineteen. You got it in nineteen eighteen. You don't have it in two thousand eighteen. All right, we're down yeah. to about a minute. Uh, Joe, any other ideas, thoughts you want to throw out real quick before we wrap? Yeah, up? I want to tell Doug, Doug Doug Bigelow to hang on to his knickers. Uh, he's about to sell a lot of these a lot of these books uh, because he's about to get the Bob Swick bump. Uh, when you review this book and, and <laughs> Bernard Gray, so uh, well, I th- hope that's so. good it's, for what? Ten, ten, twenty thousand copies being sold. I, the the no, Bob Swick bump. Six, six digits, more like six digits. Six digits. <laughs> but again, <laughs> rev up the printer, Doug. 
We're, all right, 30 seconds. I've got to wrap things up. Joe, thanks for being on. I'd like to thank all our listeners. Again, sponsored by MSB Sports Cards. Check out their website, msbsportscards.com. BSD Auctions. Check out their website, their upcoming auction, bsdauctions.com. One more plug for Doug. Gridiron the Great, Grid, I'm sorry, gridirononthegreatlake.com. His order instructions. Give Amazon a break. Buy it directly from Doug. Uh, that'll help him out a little better. And uh, make sure you read the book. Joe, we'll be back in, a, in uh, hopefully in a, in a week or two. We've got a couple guests lined up. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. And, again, if you're not subscribed to Gridiron Greats Magazine, please do gridirongreatsmagazine.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Each week, the official Football Learning Academy podcast will take you deep into the history of pro football through interviews with players, coaches, or administrators in the NFL, as well as interviews with Pro Football Hall of Fame selectors, authors, and historians. You'll learn how the game evolved and important moments that shaped the sport into what it is today. And don't miss the Pro Football History Nugget of the Week. Listen to the official Football Learning Academy podcast on the Sports History Network. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.